Alleluia! Christ is risen! Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God, he himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age.
Our first reading comes from the Acts of the Apostles. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The Word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, 
who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What were you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. The story in our Gospel reading today is both mysterious and mundane. In a mundane sense, it is a very simple story after all the dramatic and miraculous events in recent chapters. Two ordinary people walk to a nearby town, meeting up with and talking with a stranger on the way. And then they all share a meal before the two return to their friends to relate what they had learned. But as soon as we take a closer look, the mysteries arise. The two disciples here are otherwise unknown. They're not mentioned in any other story or gospel. One may very well be a woman, and the other is simply named Cleopas, which is the only occurrence of this name in the entire Bible. These two disciples appear to have all the facts, but no understanding. Further, without specified reason, or explanation of how it happens, we are told that these dedicated followers who have clung to Jesus' words and teaching and presence during his time of ministry are kept from recognizing him when he shows up to walk alongside them. Jesus in disguise then interprets the scriptures and explains everything to them, but they still do not understand or recognize him. When the crucial moment comes and that recognition finally dawns, Jesus immediately disappears. They are left with memories of emotion and sensation alone to take with them, hurrying back through the dark to find and tell their friends in Jerusalem. This story of Emmaus has been a favorite of preachers and various interpreters through the centuries and has many lessons and applications. I would like to share one with you today from 400 years ago with the help of our own art historian, Bernie Schultz. So let us take advantage of the visual medium that we are using in this age of pandemic and look to a piece titled The Supper at Emmaus, created by the Italian Baroque painter Caravaggio in 1601. Caravaggio was one of many painters who took on this scene, but he has managed to capture the pivotal moment in a special way. He has taken the very heart of the story 
and given us a picture of that dramatic split second just after the disciples grasp the truth, yet just before Jesus disappears. Here you see the classic figures depicted. On the left, standing, is the innkeeper of the establishment they are eating in. He seems to be listening in fascination to Jesus, but without any prior relationship or likely knowledge of what occurred in recent past, he doesn't display any evidence of surprise at this moment. His shadow cast on the blank wall behind makes a dark halo that serves to highlight the central figure of Jesus. The table in the center is laden with symbols. We see water, a pitcher likely containing wine, grapes, and bread. The basket in the foreground that is almost falling off towards us casts a shadow that suggests a fish, a frequent symbol of Christianity and an element of the meals Jesus shared with others. The disciple on the right has stretched out his arms in a dramatic gesture which seems to point back to Jesus' crucifixion. It may also serve to foreshadow the disciples' own future death, as many of Jesus' first followers eventually followed their leader in this way, particularly if this figure was intended to depict the Apostle Peter, as some have claimed was the second unnamed disciple. He wears a cockle shell on his lapel, which marks him for a pilgrim. The final attending figure to the lower left has lurched forward in his chair, placing his hands as if about to leap out in surprise. You can feel his emotion and sense his movement even in this still capture. And then there is Jesus in the center, portrayed without the traditional beard as if in his disguise that has just broken. He alone is wearing the first century Middle Eastern garb, while the others reflect the somewhat tattered, ordinary clothing of the common Italian citizen of the time. Unlike many similar depictions around this era, Jesus here is not making a liturgical sign with his hands, but merely reaching forward as if to invite us, as the viewer, into the meal. His face, with its cast-down eyes and brilliantly lit cheeks, is compelling and welcoming as a friend, rather than preaching as an authority figure. He seems to be blessing the bread in the moment before breaking it. But if so, then his raised right hand is extending that blessing out to us, the viewer. Caravaggio, a painter who preferred the company and carousing of the commoners of Rome to the approval of the wealthy patrons who commissioned these works, gives us an experience of this moment as a simple sharing of communion and connection over an ordinary meal rather than a liturgical or religious ceremony. It is all the more powerful for what it leaves out. In Caravaggio's painting, as for Luke's writing, Jesus came and remains for the poor, and his work is centered in the radical act of sharing food and hospitality in common with the outcast, the doubting, and the stranger. What strikes me about this story today, as this painting emphasizes, is the context of revelation and belief. As it begins, the two disciples clearly know much, and Jesus provides even further knowledge. But none of this changes that lack which Jesus points out, the slowness of their hearts. The facts have been captured in the mind, but they are disconnected from truly encountering the reality of Jesus. 
The miraculous breakthrough happens in a mundane exchange. The disciples first beg this stranger to accept their hospitality and fellowship with them. And in accepting, Jesus sits down and blesses bread to share. Caravaggio has captured the shock of these two recognizing the sacred as already, always present in the midst of the secular. The disciples suddenly understand that Jesus is fully with them every time they break bread with a stranger. Just as Matthew wrote in his gospel that the poor, the homeless, the imprisoned, the hungry are the presence of Christ to us in our lives, so this story of Luke's and the painting of Caravaggio tell us that it is in ordinary, everyday encounters with the other that we find Jesus to be present with us in our lives. And so as we break bread with our families in isolation, as we help the sick and the destitute in the means that we can, as we support food ministries, as we invite each other into relationship in new ways, let us remember the disguises Jesus wears. Let us feel again the burning of our hearts. Let us be converted once again to turn toward each other, to heal, to feed, to love, and to ever see that we host the very presence of Christ in our midst as we turn to the stranger and the outcast. Amen. Let us recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O 
O God, in whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciple in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Silver and gold did not buy us our freedom, but the self-sacrificing love of the Lamb. In thanksgiving for this blessed gift, we offer our prayers, responding to each petition by saying, Hear us, O risen Christ. Open our ears and eyes to hear your word in the midst of the daily routine, to see in others your holy presence, discovering through the voices of the poor and downtrodden your cry for justice. Let us pray. Enlarge our ministry to welcome the uninitiated to receive the sacrament of baptism, opening the door for them to share in the death and resurrection of Christ and the freedom to begin life anew. Let us pray. Imbue our souls with your body and blood, the gladness and joy that fill our souls, and from which our love for one another overflows in mercy. Let us pray. Release the gift of peace wherever it is entombed in fear, that resources spent to create armaments for war may instead be given for medical centers, schools, agricultural development, and employment opportunities. Let us pray. Encourage the church to develop new ways of communicating its message, receiving guidance from the past as new expressions are developed to speak to the present age and the generations to come. Let us pray. Give the dying an assurance of eternal life. Bring comfort to the grieving and grant the freedom of redemption to those who have entered into the eternal rest. Let us pray. Dear people of God, let us remember that gold and silver are false treasures compared to the risen Christ, in whom we continue our prayers. We pray now for those on our prayer list. Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Odell, Irene, Rich, Kevin, Raylan, Mike, Alicia, Lee, Doug, Nina, Sandy, Sam, Teresa, Jeff, Hap, Carrie, Kathy, Jesse, Jennifer, Mary Frances, Amanda, Donna, and Mary. For all who have died in communion of your church, especially Ronnie Gerlinghouse and Jean Anderson, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Zion, Charlestown, and in our companion diocese in Colombia, we pray for the Reverend Gonzalo Rendon, Parroquia Monte Carmelo. Additional prayers may be offered at this time, either silently or aloud. We pray for all of those struggling in this pandemic, those in the medical field, those who are sick. 
those who have lost jobs or income. Give us strength and solidarity together to support one another in this time. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Joining now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. 
Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And now we recognize birthdays and anniversaries in our church. The birthdays of Shelley, Greg, Carter, and Casey. An anniversary of Mark and Linda. Join now in this birthday prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthday of these your children, we pray that the year of head will be one of blessing and peace, and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And joining now in our prayer for anniversary. Loving God, you have blessed this couple with the gift of marriage. We pray that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other, and that they will find in each other the reflection of your abiding and sustaining grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As for announcements, um, I think it's good to be aware that our bishop has um, guided all, all parishes in our diocese to remain closed through May 15th at this time. Updates will be given once we know more, whether that is extended or not. For now, we have uh, three events happening on Sundays at 9 o'clock. Uh, we have our The Wisdom Jesus book study and discussion group. If you missed the beginning of that this morning, please join us next week. Um, it's something that we would encourage you to go ahead and come to, even if you have missed the first session. I think you'll still get a lot out of it, and we would love to have your contribution to that discussion. We will also continue having the virtual coffee hour following our service. So that's today at 11 a.m., and that's on Zoom, or you can call in with a phone number and meeting code that you'll find in your bulletin. We also will continue our evening prayers on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, right now, that is at 7.30. We will progressively move that later as we try to keep up roughly with uh, sunset, um, but this week it will remain at 7.30, and those can be found um, on our YouTube channel, and um, they will, the links to those will be posted in our emails during the week. We continue to pray that everyone here in our parish remains safe, healthy, and provided for, let us know if there are needs that we can help with. We want to be here for our community. And also, we pray that you, we will all be able to be the hands of God in our larger community here in Morgantown and around the region. And now, glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.